I used to play in this melodic death metal band called Naraxis. Uh, Eric, my guitar player, one of my best friends, one of my oldest friends, he used to play in a band called Necrotic Mutation. He's like two years older than I am, so I remember I was in high school playing slow ass blast beats on the on the high school drum set and then uh, the lady who was like uh, supervising everything, they were like, yo, you like death metal, right? I was like, yeah, I love it. And he, she was like, do you know this band, Necrotic Mutation? I was like, yo, they're one of my favorite local bands. She was like, well, I know the guitar player. I was like, no way. And so one thing led to another and I got to assist a Necrotic Mutation jam. And that's how I met Eric. So I was like 16 at the time, he was like 18. And to me, it was like a huge honor, you know, watching them rehearse, hanging out with the boys. And uh, that's how Eric and I met. I joined Hidden Pride, I joined Naraxis. These were bands, death metal bands that already existed in the Montreal scene. And they would play shows with Necrotic Mutation. So one thing led to another. And then actually Eric and I started sharing the stage, started, started talking more and more. He was doing his band, I was doing mine. And we were like, yo, let's try something different. I would love to play music with you. I was still playing drums back then. And we started a cover band. We were doing like rock covers. And then we did that for a couple of months. And then we were like, yo, man, I mean, this kind of sucks. <laughs> and then we were always talking about all these brutal death metal bands that we were listening to. And then we were on Mount Royal uh, um, in Montreal, smoking a little joint, end of summer 2000. And he was like, yo, how about we just start a brutal death metal band, you know? And uh, Suffocation and Dying, Me uh, Dying Fetus uh, being early influences on us, uh, that, that was sort of like the icebreaker. Let's try and do something along those lines. But as I said, he and I were already in multiple death metal bands prior to this band, which ultimately became the Spies Icon, but we didn't have a band name back then. So we were like, how do we switch it up? How do we bring something new to the table that makes it fresh and interesting, not only for us, uh, but for, you know, the death metal fans out there. So I had this, this idea, I, you know, I grew up in the death metal scene, but I was going to more and more punk rock shows or hardcore shows just on my own because none of my metal friends wanted to join. And then I was like, Eric, how, do you, how would you feel about mixing, you know, certain hardcore elements or certain grindcore elements to this band? He was like, let's try it out, you know? And back then, you know, we're talking about year 2000, 2001. This was not, this was not a thing. And uh, I remember back then going to a show and this band from New York State, Rochester or Albany, I forget, they were called Malamore. And they were playing this groovy death metal and they kept, they kept using the word deathcore. And I was like, deathcore? What's deathcore? This makes a whole lot of sense. And then I sort of applied to the term to our music and our very first shirt was just a simple Despise Icon logo. No death metal font, no, 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 no gory lettering or anything. We wanted to do something different. So it was more like a, a logo reminiscent of like all the Trust Kill or all the Ferret bands. And it just said Despise Icon Montreal Deathcore. And um, that was our mindset at the time. And uh, we grouped up with a couple of friends and one thing led to another and then we played our very first show beginning of 2002 in Montreal. It was, I believe, the first or the second bloodletting North America tour. Uh, Disgorge were on that, Disavowed as well. And you know, Disgorge and Devourment, those were two influential bands for us as well. Um, they were one of my first, uh, they were like the bands that introduced me like to the gutturals and the squeals and all that. And, that's something that we applied to our band as well, you know. Um, back then I was the drummer. Uh, we had a female vocalist named Mary. Uh, she had more of a like straightforward, um, you know, uh, classic death metal growl. And I wanted to bring that gory or brutal element to our sound. And so I was like, Eric, because how would you feel about just having a second vocalist? And he was like, I don't know, whatever. Seems kind of lame, but you seem to, be into that idea so let's try it out so we posted a an ad on a on a metal message board and only one person applied and that was steve and i had seen his band perform their one and only show they were called apocalyptic script 
fucking garbage name, but whatever. And I was like, yeah, I saw that kid live, man. He's doing inhales, it sounded brutal. Let's try him out, you know? And Apocalyptic Script had members from Ion Dissonance before Ion Dissonance was even a band. So, you know, that was the brotherhood, man. We all go way back. We've always been very supportive of our music, of, uh, of all of our friends' music. So that was the original incarnation of Despise Icon. Played our first uh, show in Montreal in 2002 at the X Club, a venue that I saw a lot of bands for the first time, whether it's H2O, uh, Dillinger Escape Plan, or a whole bunch of death metal bands too. Uh, I remember seeing uh, a tour, what was it? It was like Gore Guts and Dying Fetus. Oh my God, what a lineup. But anyways, played our first show. One thing led to another and like, we were very low key back then. This was before YouTube. This was before MySpace. Internet was around, but it wasn't like the biggest tool. We were still, you know, handing out flyers the old school way and like, you know, really meeting people at shows. And that's how the original Despise Icon lineup came about, you know, just meeting people at shows. I think we played maybe five shows in 2002, six shows in 2003. And then we were like, yo, I love playing music. I love being in the band with you guys. Let's go all in. Let's do everything we possibly can to get out there and get the fuck out of Quebec, you know? I love Quebec, but it's it's just so hard for a Canadian band to make it out of Canada. And then, you know, I, I keep mentioning Cryptopsy and Cataclysm and Comeback Kid, but like those bands were very inspirational to me because they actually made it out of the country. So I was like, you know what, they did it, so I'm gonna do it. And that was my mindset. I hand assembled the demos, uh, uh, send them through snail mail, one, one after the other. I remember sending it to Willow Tip Records, Relapse Records, Central Media Records, uh, a bunch of labels. And, and curiously enough, they hit me back and they cared and they were into it. So in 2004, that's when I feel, that's when things really started moving. Yeah, one thing led to another and we started, started t uh, talking with uh, Abacus Records, which was like the metalcore, hardcore division of Century Media. And they were like, yo, we're really into this, but there's too many blast beats. I'm not sure it would go over well with our fan base or our, our audience. So we're gonna try and push it to Century Media. And back then Century used to sign a whole lot of bands and, and, and uh, I don't know, the Abacus dudes, my friend Roy, my friend Ray, were really uh, into the project, staying for Stacy at Abacus. And uh, thanks to those three, Central Media were like, you know what, oh, whatever, this Despise Icon band, let's try it out. So we signed a deal and fuck man, the rest is history. That's how we got a booking agent. That's how we started touring America for the first time, beginning in 2005. Uh, and we toured with our teenage idols, man, it was crazy. Our first uh, US tour was with uh, DSI, Immolation, Skinless, and I I've never been that big of a DSI fan, truthfully, but they're awesome and I really do respect their legacy, but I know it was a really big thing for the rest of my bandmates. And then our second US tour right after that was Cryptopsy and Suffocation, two of my favorite bands of all time. And that's when I was like, wow, nothing else matters, man. This is what I wanna do with my life. We actually have a shot at this. But there was only one problem. Nobody at the shows gave a fuck. You know, and back then we we were paying, we were getting paid, you know, chump change, making no money, so we had no crew. Every night I'd be at the merch table right before a set. Then I would jump on stage, play a show, get flipped off by a whole bunch of people, and then go back to the merch table. And <laughs> one, two, three people came out, bought a shirt, and that was that, you know? So it was humble beginnings, man. In 2007, that's when the deathcore movement started to get organized. Uh, that's when bands like Job for a Cowboy put out their first EP, same for Suicide Silence. You know, next thing you know, there's Whitechapel, Oceano, Carnifex, you know, and, and those bands had it hard as well, you know, but they stuck to it as well. I remember playing our first show with Carnifex. We were on tour with Suicide Silence and they were doing like a DIY tour and got added to our last Las Vegas date. We were playing a skate park and they got added so last minute that they had to play after Suicide Silence. And there was a massive walkout, like 90% of the kids just left. 
but they still gave it all. And I, I appreciate that persistence. And, and I gotta congratulate my friends in Carnifex especially. They are one of the most hard, hardworking bands that I know. And their shit's popping right now. And they really put the time and effort and the work into it. So if you're in a band out there, let that be a lesson to you. Expect no handouts, just knock on a bunch of doors until ultimately people start answering. Starting 2007, uh, people were actually starting to come and watch us live and be super supportive. And then, you know, I was into bands like All Shall Perish that had their humble beginnings as well. And like, they were starting to pop off as well. And then it was just so motivating and, and awesome to see this movement finally coming together, you know? And so we just toured full time, full time, full time. We had reached a point where we lost a member here and there with the spies. And then uh, my friend Al from Massachusetts, Al, Al Glassman joined the band in 2007 during the Ills of Modern Man era. So I apologize, I'm backtracking here. So he joined the band and then we lost our bass player because he had a kid as well. And he knew this guy, Max, with whom he had been, uh, with whom he played in Goratory with. Another kid from Massachusetts, he joined the Spies Icon. Ultimately in 2010, we, we became burnt out. You know, we were end of our 20s, beginning of our 30s. And uh, like that spark went missing somewhere along the way. And all, all this traveling, all this touring just became work. And that's quite sad, you know? And so we took a step back. We ultimately, we broke up. And uh, you know, a lot of the boys had good career op opportunities. They were starting families and I've always been respectful of that. And I was like, you know what? Yeah, guys, I'm gonna do the same thing. And then I had a real job for like a year. Probably like the only real meaningful job I had in my adult life, aside from music, obviously. Working in an office and I just remember being super miserable. So I started in another band, started touring all over again. But uh, the rest of the boys in Despise, they just, stuck to it, lived the life at home. And then Max joined the Black Dahlia Murder, which is one of the bands we toured with the most. And so he was with Black Dahlia, and that was the thing. In 2014, we went to a Black Dahlia show to support Max, and Gorguts were also on the lineup. And the one and only drummer that ever filled in for Alex Grind on one tour, the only tour that Grind missed, was Pat from Gorguts. So we went and supported Gorguts, we went and supported Max, started reminiscing on all these tour stories. Remember when we did that, remember, remember when we broke down on the side of the highway here and there and all that, and we became super nostalgic, man. And, you're, and we were like, you know what? The kids are like three, four, five years old now. Stuff is a little bit more manageable. Why don't we play a couple of reunion shows? So we played reunion shows in 2014, and that little spark that went missing that I described earlier, it came back and the magic was back. And all of a sudden we remembered why we were doing this shit in the first place. And, you know, taking that step back, we understood how fortunate we were to be given this opportunity to tour the world, to play music for a living, extreme music, you know? And that's something quite rare. And we were like, yo boys, let's do this again. And then I hit up Gerardo, who I met at uh, Century Media, because he used to work there back, work th there back in the day, told him about how we were trying to put the band back together, and he didn't even hear any of the music. He was like, "Let's do it, let's do it," and I was like, "Really? Yeah, we're in." And that was highly motivational as well, because I grew up listening to a lot of Nuclear Blast artists, and yeah, just fast forward a year or two later, we put out Beast in 2016. And uh, we've been touring religiously once a year, three weeks out of the year, because that's all we can manage for the time being. Uh, but yeah, it's 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 great now. Every show is is not just a show. It's 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 an event. It's like a vacation. It's super special. It's not like punching in the work or anything. And that's why we're back. That's why we're doing it. And uh, yeah. The result is purgatory, man. I'm so proud of this shit. I'm glad to still be here, and I want to keep playing music for the rest of my life. So, Spies Icon forever. Oh, man.